This Russian was, in his youth, one of the first men to gaze on the scene of perhaps the most awesome destruction ever wrought on the face of the earth. And he's lived with the riddles he found there ever since. Fifty years ago, he set out by horse and sledge across the frozen wastes of Siberia to investigate the great cataclysm of Tunguska. For on the morning of June the 30th, 1908, something came hurtling out of the sky, an enormous ball of fire, which exploded above the Siberian forest with a sound that was heard a thousand miles away and a blast that laid waste the trees over an area the size of London and New York put together. For weeks afterwards, the nights in Europe were almost as bright as day. These pictures were taken after midnight. A lifetime later, the theories still abound about what it was that came out of the sky that June day. Was it a colossal meteorite, a black hole from interstellar space, an atomic bomb long before such bombs were invented? Could it even have been a spaceship? A mystery from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now living in Sri Lanka, he has studied the enigma of the great Siberian explosion. So imagine that, as I'm standing here, that thing detonates five miles above us. Well, there would have been a flash in the sky so brilliant that by comparison, the sun is a feeble electric light bulb. The flash of light and heat would have boiled the sea around us and set the city on fire instantly. Then the blast wave, the concussion, you can't use the word sound, it's just a devastating, pulverizing concussion, would have flattened all the buildings, except possibly the one immediately beneath the explosion, which might have stayed upright, as indeed in Hiroshima, buildings directly under the center of detonation remain standing. But what we're talking about now is something 1,000 times more devastating than the first atom bomb in Hiroshima. More than 70 years after the Great Siberian Explosion, the scientists still come together to puzzle over that catastrophic event in 1908. Dr. Nikolai Vasiliev and Professor Alexander Dolgov have flown in from Tomsk and Novosibirsk to meet at the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Professor Yavnol comes from the Meteorite Committee of the USSR. And Dr. Leonid Krinov, one of the first scientists to reach the site, is still active. The discussions go on, because to this day they are still not sure what happened in the depths of the Siberian wilderness on that June morning. The investigation into the mystery of the Siberian explosion began in 1921, just after the Russian Revolution. The Academy of Sciences was one of the first institutions to be set up by the Bolsheviks in Petrograd, now Leningrad, and it was decided that the new scientific socialism should also be in the vanguard of the natural sciences. The Academy gave a commission to a young scientist called Leonid Kulik to investigate falls of meteorites on the territory of the USSR. A friend showed Kulik an eyewitness story on the back of an old calendar, his first hint of the extraordinary happening 13 years before in 1908. It was a strange time. Far away in England, the Daily Express of July the 3rd, 1908, reported the weird happenings of an already unusually hot summer. It said, the extraordinary occurrence of night trains running over the Grampian Hills without lights took place for the first time on record. 
A golfer wrote to the Times saying it was light enough for play on the links at Brancaster in Norfolk at 11 p.m. and he himself was aroused at 1.15 a.m. and could read a book in his chamber quite comfortably. This photograph of Whitkirk Church in Leeds was taken long after what should have been dusk. And this houseboat at Gloucester was snapped towards midnight. What people took to be the northern lights lit up the whole east coast. The Royal Meteorological Society reported an extreme shock in southern England, followed by the vibrations of an air blast which travelled twice around the world. Kulik found similar evidence in the local press of Siberia. The Tomsk paper thought a meteor had struck. Armed with these few details, Kulik set off on the Trans-Siberian Railway from Petrograd, across European Russia and half of Siberia, to the small station of Taishet. There he and his helpers left the train and set off towards the Angara River. From there on, they had only horse and boat to take them through the ice and snow of the Siberian forest, the taiga. There were endless river crossings, made more hazardous by the spring thaw. Eventually, accompanied by the great Soviet cameraman Strukov, they reached the tiny trading post of Vanavara. The local people were fur traders, Mongols of the Avenki tribe, with hunting territory running up the Tunguska River. It was now 20 years since they had experienced the extraordinary event of 1908. But as Dr. Krinov recalls, they still had the most vivid memories. Well, there was Luchat Khan Smirnov. I questioned him and he told me in detail how he was hurled from his porch by the wave of air. He was literally thrown from his porch and he lost consciousness. His daughter, a young girl, was at the time with her friend down by the stream. And when they heard the thunder and all the explosions, they ran back home and saw him lying on the ground. Another eyewitness was on the far side of his hut, hammering something or other there. So he was shielded by the hut from the place where the radiation came from. But he felt that his ears had been scorched just as if he had walked into a hot, fiercely heated steam bath. His ears were scorched and he grabbed himself by the ears and ran inside. Well, by that time, everything had already finished. At Vanavara, Kulik's expedition set about building small boats, which could take them upriver towards the area where the locals said the explosion had happened. There were many privations. Negotiating the rivers needed all the skills the local porters could muster. At one point, Kulik himself, with Strukov still filming, lost control of his boat and was almost swept away. It was the end of May before they made any significant progress. At one stage, the porters refused to go on towards a place they still viewed with some terror. At last they reached the quieter waters of the upper Tunguska and finally the junction with the river Chombi.
From its southern bank, they could see that the tops of all the trees had been sheared off. They crossed the river and climbed through the battered forest to be confronted at the top of a ridge by a chilling sight. As far as the eye could see, the trees lay like an annihilated regiment in serried rows, victims of some unimaginable slaughter. Taiga, который повсюду могучий сибирский тайга стояла. The taiga, the mighty Siberian taiga, had everywhere been thick and without any clearings or glades. Десятки километров. But here we suddenly saw this place where the forest had been flattened for many kilometers. The young trees that had grown after the event were still not very tall, and therefore they were covered by the snow. It was this that made the first and strongest impression. We clearly saw the dimensions of the destruction. Of course, this made a shattering impression on us. Kulik, Krinov, Strukov and their helpers pressed on day after day through the debris of bare and fallen trees. They had no idea how far they would have to go to find the center of the devastation. They made camp, living as best they could with limited supplies, off the land and the water. Though even fishing had its hazards. Eventually, after fighting their way for more than 60 miles through the tangled mess of fallen trees and new growth, they reached, 20 years after the event, the heart of the explosion. Kulik was to call the place the Tunguska South Swamp, the center of 1,000 square miles of devastation. Convinced a meteorite must be the cause, Kulik immediately began surveying the mosquito-ridden swamp. He thought that pieces of the object which had caused such immense damage might be found in peculiar pits in the swamp. His men drained the pits and excavated them without result. This tree stump at the bottom of one hole was proof that this at least couldn't be a crater caused by a meteor. Kulik persisted, but not a trace of a meteor was ever to be found. Then the weather deteriorated. So few provisions were left that I set off with one man for the Vanovara trading post with squirrel skins to trade for money to buy food. Kulik stayed behind with two men and he was forced to kill a dog to eat though men with supplies did eventually arrive. I myself got frostbitten, and the men who traveled with me also got frostbite in his feet, and we were forced to go to the hospital at Kezhna, where we spent two months. Well, what was the thing that detonated above the Siberian swamp in 1908? be no end of theories. One is that it was a rather small lump of antimatter, perhaps only a few pounds. Antimatter is material which has its atoms oppositely charged from those of our ordinary terrestrial matter. So if a pound of antimatter meets a pound of ordinary matter, the two annihilate each other, giving a colossal explosion. The other is that it was a very small black hole, if such things exist. And I say very small, perhaps too small to be seen, but yet still weighing millions and millions of tons. Again, if a thing like that plowed into the Earth, it would go right through our planet and cause a colossal explosion at the point where it entered and the point where it went out. The remarkable similarity between the Tunguska event 
and the after effects of the Hiroshima bomb has prompted many people to suggest that it was some kind of nuclear explosion. The heat flash was very similar. Trees at Tunguska were charred on the side towards the explosion, but on the shadow side they were comparatively unaffected. Exactly the sort of thing that happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, how could one have a nuclear explosion 40 years before we had invented the atom bomb? Well, perhaps a visitor from space had engine trouble and tried to make a forced landing on our Earth and didn't make it, but blew up five miles above the surface. There's been at least one book written on this subject and a lot of science fiction stories. And it is a plausible theory and certainly a very romantic one. But this romantic theory is still considered seriously by respectable scientists, particularly in the Soviet Union. This is Soviet academician Alexei Zolotov. The Tunguska explosion took place in the air. There exist only two possibilities for such an explosion. Either it came from an internal energy source in the body or from the natural energy caused by its movement. I believe it was a nuclear explosion from an artificially made object. The spaceship theory was born after the atomic bomb explosions of the 40s and 50s. The devastation caused by the bombs dropped on Japan was remarkably like that at Tunguska. The concrete buildings at the center of the Nagasaki blast still stood upright, as did the trees at the center of Tunguska. The charring of the trees, even signs of radiation at Tunguska, resembled atomic bomb after effects. Kulik was killed by the Nazis during the Battle of Moscow, and it was 1958 before the first post-war expedition was mounted. It was now possible to get by air to Vannevara. But the team still had to use precarious and inadequate boats, and needed the help of the local reindeer herdsmen to carry their supplies. They also needed plenty of determination before they were able to get back to Kulik's original site. Although the new growth in the taiga was now 50 years old, the devastation was still very plain. Again, there was the vile work of surveying and testing in the most impossible terrain, assaulted still by summer insects. Slowly, the evidence built up, but there was still no sign of any debris from the Tunguska blast, except for tiny globules of silica and metal. Carefully packed to be sent back for analysis, they were to provide an important clue there were continuing echoes of a nuclear explosion. In the first place, it was clear that the Tunguska blast, like that at Hiroshima, had been an airburst. No one had thought of that in 1928. But the Russians decided to check with a precise experiment. It was true. Whatever devastated the Tiger in 1908 had exploded about eight kilometers, five miles, up in the air. Out in the forest, the researchers, returning every year now by plane and helicopter and armed with sophisticated equipment, found extraordinary genetic effects. There seemed to be several mutated species of insects. And among the devastated skeletons of the trees, there were some which had survived. When these were felled, the tree rings showed a dramatic increase in growth after 1908. This effect had also appeared in Hiroshima. Whether or not this was due to nuclear radiation, the man who today leads the yearly expeditions to the taiga, Nikolai Vasiliev, is certain there is what he calls electromagnetic chaos. Right up to the present time, we have been investigating certain geophysical and biological effects 
which are not observed when normal meteorites fall. In particular, the genetic pattern has been violated. This violation is to be seen in certain species of plants and in particular in the pine trees. There is certainly some new type of radiation here. The explosion of a cosmic body seems to have produced this new type of radiation field on the ground at the center of the blast. The discussion continues among the experts and volunteers at the annual summer camps. It has become apparent that the little globules they have collected contain elements that could only have come from outer space. Slowly, many scientists have come round to a theory first proposed in the 30s by an Englishman, Frank Whipple, and dismissed then as far too fanciful. His theory was that for the only time in all our knowledge, the Earth had been struck by a comet. Comets are among the most romantic objects in the universe. Great shining bodies with tails thousands of miles long, sweeping through the solar system and turning around the sun, either to disappear forever or to return to our view only after many years. But the comet theory doesn't convince academician Zolotov. The main argument against it being a comet is the fact that the cosmic body was apparently moving at such a slow speed. For it to be an explosion involving natural energy, the body would have to be moving extremely fast. In theory, no less than 30 kilometers a second. If the body had been a natural object moving at this great speed, with a mass of a million or more tons and a hundred meters across, then it would have uprooted the forest in a huge strip more than a hundred kilometers across for a great distance before the actual explosion. But Dr. Vasiliev and his colleague, Professor Alexander Dolgov, who did the chemical analysis of the globules, feel the evidence now points most clearly to a comet. We've got a large content of hydrogen, which is a typical cosmic element. Then we got quite large amounts of carbon dioxide, which in its frozen state seems to make up the heads of comets. We also got a certain quantity of hydrocarbons, probably methane. This too is very characteristic of the structure of the front part of comets. Now comets are associated with meteor streams, the sort of rivers of meteorites which flow around the sun and intersect the Earth's orbit at regular intervals. Another day I was going through a book on comets and meteors and I came across what I think is the solution to this particular mystery. There's a stream of meteors known as the beta taurids. They hit the Earth, this stream of meteors, every 30th of June the same date as the Tunguska event. And I am pretty sure that the Tunguska explosion was something to do with the stream of meteorites, the beta torrids, every 30th of June. Inevitably, something like Tunguska will happen somewhere on the Earth. It could happen tomorrow, it could happen in the next five minutes. I would say it will certainly happen within the next thousand years. If it does happen fairly soon, and it isn't too large a comet, it might trigger a thermonuclear war, because an explosion like that in any country could easily be mistaken for an attack by ICBMs. However, a very large comet, well, I'm afraid it wouldn't leave anyone to worry about. At the end of every summer now, Dr. Vasiliev and his team, with almost religious fervor, watch the dawn in that still remote region of the Tunguska explosion in Siberia. Every year, the Russians vow that they will return 
to seek a little more knowledge about the most awesome event which has ever struck this earth in all the recorded history of man. Next week, the riddle of the stones.